Hi, fellow teachers. I'm Ismael Lizario, and I'm from De La Salle Santiago Zobel School of Hermosa Campus. I teach science there to senior high school students, and my talk for today is all about how we can maximize the features of Google Forms in creating learning playlists for asynchronous learning. But what exactly are these learning playlists? Let me show you one as an example. This one is an, is an example of a learning playlist which I did using HyperDocs, and you can see that it begins with an introduction, an overview of what's coming up ahead, and I also gave instructions as to how they can contact me because this is for this is an asynchronous kind of task, right? So they also have to obtain some information from me or to make some inquiries. So I give them my email address or how they can contact me, and then it starts with the Lasallian guiding principle because Zabel is a Lasall school and for part one, we have the learning target as well as the contents, okay? And then if you click this hyperlink, which says click this link to accomplish part one, that will direct the student to the first part of the task, which is in Google Forms format. So all they have to do is to accomplish this one. Let's say, for example, let's try this. Surname, okay. So let's just do this as quick as we can. Okay, so let's say section G. Okay, and that's the learning target. and then if you look at the first, at the next page after the personal information, you can see that there's a learning video that they have to study and they have to answer a couple of questions for them to be able to um, get some feedback by submitting the form. Okay, so that's basically what the lear learning playlist is like. In fact, if you do a quick Google search, what edelements.com would tell you is that here, we have a really detailed and comprehensive PDF file and it tells us that a playlist is a sequence of resources or activities for students to complete. And that's exactly what we have to do whenever we want students to learn asynchronously. So we basically prepare a repository of learning materials that the students have to access and accomplish in their own pacing or at their own pace, okay? So just like this one. So there's also part two, part three, and there are specific learning targets or learning target for every part up to the last part, where, which is um, exit ticket or reflection and assessment. Okay, and, and then at the bottom, we have the teacher's notes as well as image credits. So, of course, there is no standard format for a learning playlist, but this is typically how it would look like. And basically, it can look in many different possible ways. It can be in Google Slides as well. It can be in Google Sites also. Okay, later, I'll show you an example of that. But basically, if you want to make a learning playlist, just be sure that there are enough learning materials for the students to learn from it. Okay, apart from that, okay, um, I'd also like to mention about the tips on creating instructional videos because there's also an important element if you are teaching asynchronously. You don't always curate videos or you don't always get uh, some links from Khan Academy, Professor Dave explained. So you can also make your own um, instructional videos and I have just a few tips about that, okay? So how does asynchronous learning work? It happens on the student's schedule, of course. So um, they access the materials at their most convenient time. And it's also self-paced because they will finish it at different times. Some students will finish it early. Some students will finish it um, right when the deadline is closed. And then it's a flexible experience because there are varied learning materials. And um, the students also have their own their own pacing, their own preferences. Some would watch the video, some would prefer the PDF. Okay, and there is an instructional support. So there has to be a way for the students to communicate with you whatever way possible. Okay, now um, there are a couple of concerns that I'd like to address when we are talking about asynchronous sessions. First one is lack of guidance, or maybe I should say it's just an apparent lack of guidance because sometimes students might think that they are doing things alone because there's no teacher right in front of them that can immediately tell them, or what you're doing is wrong, this is how you do it, et cetera. Okay, so um, the immediate or adequate feedback might also be an issue because if students are working asynchronously, they might not get an instant feedback when they do something. Unlike when you're in the classroom, for example, and you move around the classroom, you make them do a pair work, and then you approach every pair and ask them, how are you doing? Or, uh, do I need to help you get unstuck or something? Okay. And they might also say, my teacher is Professor Dave or I'm paying for Khan Academy simply because you have been consistent, consistently curating learning videos instead of creating your own. So that's a possible challenge that they might 
they might feel like they're just relying on certain educational sites from YouTube, which isn't really a bad thing. That's not wrong. Okay? Um, it's just that they might have this bad impression that all that they're doing is they, they're just relying purely on these online references. But how do we um, avoid having those kind of thoughts coming from the students? Okay? So that is where the major topic of my talk comes into play. Now, what I'd like to emphasize first is that we have to include an answer key and the comprehensive answer feedback when we make this learning playlist. Okay. So as an example, I'd like to show this one. I've shown this before. So this is um, the third asynchronous task that I gave my students. And let's go to part one. And we'll pretend as if we're, we're a student answering this one. So once again, of course, we have the first few information like surname, given name. Let's just do whatever here so that we can progress completely. OK, and then next. OK, so it says here that you have to watch the video about UAM, basically the what and the why, or learning target number one. Okay, So if they watch this video, they are expected to be able to answer the following questions. And there's only very few because it's just an introduction. It's just a really quick test as well for us to see if they understood the concepts that are discussed in this particular video, which I actually did. It's, it's a teacher created video. So if they answer this um practice exercises which is only three items i think um this is the correct answer okay and then for this one the correct answer is b but let's make it wrong okay just for a change and then they will click submit right okay as the students okay so what they will see as the student is that they will see that uh, there's a message at the end of the task one and it says you have submitted part one and then they can actually check their email where they will see the response received, which is actually a proof that they have done this particular task. And then they can click view score. And if they click view score, okay, it will show two over three, right? Because we intentionally made the last item wrong. Okay, so this is how it will look like in the student's perspective. And if you go to the items part, okay, there. So the students will see the items that he got correctly. Let's say this one is correct, okay. And then there is a feedback, and you should notice that there is actually a discussion for that particular item. So I explained what UAM is for them to be able to recall what it is, even if they are correct. So I want this to appear because what if they got it right for, um, let's say, Chamba. Okay, so apart from that, if you look at the nature of this question, it looks like the type of question that, that even if you tell the student that C is the correct answer, they would have some questions about the remaining choices. Like why is A wrong, for example? So whenever I sense that the nature of question is like that, what I do is I also try to discuss why the remaining items or options are not the correct answers. Let's say, for example, option A is wrong because a body in UAM does not have a constant velocity, et cetera. I do the same for the rest because what I want is that after answering these practice items, they don't have any remaining questions at all. Let's say, for example, Ms. Leia, I, I actually get it that Letter C is the correct answer. It agrees with the definition of UAM. But what is wrong with these particular choices? Aren't, aren't they similar to this item? Something like that. So they have common misconceptions that um that might confuse them. And that's what I try to address whenever I make an answer feedback. Okay. So if you go on with the rest of the items, okay, great job on analyzing a data table. Okay, that's the feedback because it's a correct answer. And again, there's a discussion. It has to be this thorough. I know it's actually me. Uh, a really tedious job to do, but if you look at the consequences, like people having um, very few questions at the end of the playlist, I think that it's really going to be very sensible to do a little sacrifice. Also, if you look at the last item, so that's wrong, they would see it's wrong, and they are marked zero over one for that. And of course, there's a feedback as well. So they will understand why they are wrong. Because the thing is, it's not sufficient that you simply write the correct answer or you simply indicate the correct answer. The best thing to do is to put an answer feedback because in in face-to-face -face instruction, that's what we actually do, right? Whenever we make them answer a particular question in a slide, for example, we would explain afterwards why letter A, for example, is the correct answer or why this particular option is wrong, etc. So that's how it should look like. Okay. So any more examples apart from that? Okay. So let's try some more. 
Okay, let's see this one. It's my playlist for um, optics or mirrors, actually. Okay, so if you take a look at, let's say, part three. Okay, let's do this one. Let's look at what we got here. So what I did here, that one was multiple choice. It's easy to set the answer key for multiple choice items, right? By the way, um, in thinking of how I will discuss this one, I have an assumption that you at least know the basics of Google Forms. And I actually don't plan to teach those things really thoroughly. I just want to tell you how you can maximize what Google Forms can actually do for you as a teacher and for them as a learner, okay? So just a disclaimer, I, I'm not making a Google Form tutorial. Okay? So I'm just telling you how you can maximize what it has to offer. Okay, so let's say, let's take a look at another example. So there is a correct answer here as well. It's 7.5 centimeter. Okay. So what I also do with that is I also make sure that I am careful with the answer key. Example, if you look at these correct answers, um, one has a space between negative 7.5 and centimeter. Well, the other option is negative 7.5 and then centimeter immediately, no space in between. The thing is that um, Google Forms is really sensitive with um, with the case. Okay? Let's say, for example, you don't put a space or you capitalize something. And then the answer key that the teacher put does not agree with that. It, it will be marked as incorrect. So if you think of it, this is actually fine, although the standard way of doing is this one. But this is actually acceptable. I mean, for me, I would mark this correct. So what I do in case, the, for example, that the student um, carelessly types it and he or she fails to put a space between the magnitude and the unit, I would make sure that in the answer key, I would put that possible, my predicted mistake, right, from the student. So that's how I would want it to look like. So and also, of course, do not forget to um, put the corresponding point. Let's say for this one, it's actually one point because um for me it's just one point okay but now there are some questions that might be more complicated you can make them two points or maybe ten points etc so it's really important to put the corresponding point so that um the total points right there on the upper part will be updated and what the students will get is their actual score over how many points there are and also you'll get an analytics for that so let's see for example you can get the mean score the median score of the student, the range as well. So those are really good analytics if you are using Google Forms, okay? So what else apart from that, okay? Another important thing that I'd like you to be careful with, if you want the students to get an immediate feedback with how they did for a particular playlist or playlist part, you have to click this um, gear button and then you have to go to quizzes, okay? So make sure that it is set as a quiz. You might overlook this part, right? You might focus on the content. You might miss the settings. Make sure that it is set as a quiz so that there will be a point values to the questions and it will allow auto grading. And then apart from that, um, I'd like you to choose immediately after each submission because what will happen is that once the student submits something, he or she will get an immediate feedback. So he will, she, he will see those things that we saw earlier, the score, the discussion of the answer, et cetera. Okay, and then, I, I always speak all of these items. I want the respondents to see the questions that they missed, the correct answers, as well as the point values. So that's it for that particular item. Okay, so let's go on with the um, slide presentation. Um, the next item says, okay, let's have a recap. So the first thing I'd like you to take into, into consideration if you are using Google Forms for your learning playlist is to include an answer key and a really comprehensive answer feedback. Apart from that, okay, I'd like you to utilize the response validation as well, okay? So what is this response validation all about? Let me show you an example. Let's say here, this particular item, it looks like an ordinary item, right? It, it has the answer key, et cetera, and then you have that question, now, what I want to do with this item is that I'm going to use response validation because I want them to have a specific answer. I am not saying I want the answer to be exactly negative 7.5 centimeter. Otherwise, you can go forward. Okay. What I want to do is that I'd like to, to do something that can remind them about the negative sign because I think some physics teachers could relate that. Um, it's really a common case for students to make a mistake with a sign. I mean, it's possible that they come, uh, come up with the correct numerical answer, but the sign is, is wrong because it naturally came out of the solution 
or is not that, they might type the answer incorrectly out of carelessness, like they forgot about the negative sign. They only they were only able to include 7.5 centimeters. But in such case, I actually hate seeing students um, making getting a wrong item or getting a, a wrong mark or a zero mark for a certain item just because of a careless mistake. Although I know there is some um, hidden curriculum to that, but still I'd like to, because this is just a learning playlist. They're just in the process of absorbing these things. I'd like to be, I like, I like them to feel my presence in this um, aspect of the lesson development by using response validation. So all I have to do is to uh, click on these three um, dots and then check the response validation. Okay. And then, okay, what will appear is, okay, so you will see all these options. It's a setup selection. And then it says uh, the answer should be a number, text, length, etc. It looks kind of confusing at first. You see a lot of stuff. But what it wants you to do is it wants you to specify something that you'd like to set for the answer of the student. Example, it's common for the student to make a mistake with the sign. Now, if I want them to have a negative answer, what I will do is that I will pick text and then I would say contains, right? Because what I want to do is for them to give me an answer which has a negative sign. So I will pick text and then contains and then I will put a negative sign, okay? What it means is that the text that they will type has to contain a negative sign. Otherwise, there will be an error text. Okay, example, are you sure with a sign? Okay, something like that. So um, what is the purpose of that? Well, it, it prevents them from finalizing an answer, which is obviously wrong because of the sign. So it's fine if they make a mistake because it's really wrong. Let's say they put um, negative 9.5, which is wrong. Okay, then it's fine. It's wrong talaga. Eh? But um, what I want to do here is to avoid um, letting them answer 7.5 centimeter when in fact there should be a negative sign. So in such case, they get reminded of the sign conventions, etc. So they don't get totally wrong because they reminded them in the middle of doing the task. Okay. So how will that look like in the student's perspective? Because I type, are you sure with a sign? And what appear to be custom error text? Okay. Whatever you put in the custom error text is the text that will appear once they don't comply with what you write here with what you specify here. Example, I specify that I want the text that contains a negative sign. So if they don't comply with that, if, if that's not present in the answer that they give, what they will see is the custom error text, which is, are you sure with a sign? So in that case, they, they sort of get to feel my presence as a teacher because I'm reminding them of the sign conventions, right? So, and it's totally fine for me because I don't mind, if you are in the process of lesson development, I don't mind if I need to correct my student in the middle of doing something. So if you work on that, say for example, okay, let's try doing it a student perspective. Let's go to that particular item, which is item 3.2. Okay, it's 3.2, right? So if you go to that part, okay, let's find it. Next, let's pretend we've done all those things. So, okay, let's say for example, I would be 7.5 centimeter. Okay, that's correct in terms of magnitude, right? But it's actually negative sign. It has to be with a negative sign. So if I go to the next item, okay, it will show me an exclamation point and it says, are you sure with a sign? In fact, I cannot submit this form if I don't um, fully fix this part. Because what I have to do is to make sure that I have the right sign, okay? This way isn't that, it's like you're making law for yourself because in that case, a student can just add a negative sign because that's the opposite of positive and then go on. But what I assume is that senior high students, they are mature enough to double check their solution and see if they're actually, if they've actually done it correctly. So that's my assumption because I'm handling senior high students. And of course, if they really want to do well in some of the assessments, they would have to do their best to learn from these uh, lesson, de lesson development playlists, right? So they would have to figure it out themselves. Why is my sign convention wrong? Why is it supposed to be negative? So they will double check that before they would probably try to change it. Okay? Or if not that, if they get, don't, don't get to figure it out, I would expect them to contact me just like what they've done before. In freely falling bodies, I actually use the same thing. I use response validation for me to remind them that height should be a positive answer because height is a scalar quantity. Although the, pro the solution will give them a negative sign because of the concept of displacement, but I, um, I reminded them to make it positive, for, for example, or to double check the sign. And 
there there were a couple of students who contacted me asking about the sign and yeah, so they raised certain clarifications and that's what i really expect from senior high students nevertheless it's fine to remind them with something that's not really a, a big deal if you're in the process of lesson development because um we don't have to be we have to be somehow generous when it comes to this stage of learning okay because learning playlists are for lesson development okay another thing what about for other subjects is it just all about a negative sign or something you can also do something else let's see for this one um it requires an essay response okay it says um explain how you could determine whether the rocket is etc okay so what you can do especially for english teacher social studies what you can do is to require a certain length okay, or a minimum character count, let's say 100, and then your custom error text would be your explanation must be insufficient. So when the students don't meet your minimum character count, what they will see is your explanation might be insufficient. So they will add some more because sometimes they might be, they might be just being reckless. They are not addressing the items fully, uh, comprehensively. Let's say this one, there are two items to address, A and B. So if they forget to answer B, they might arrive at an answer which is shorter than expected. So what I do in this case actually is I type the shortest possible answer or a way of explaining it in Microsoft Word and then I count the number of characters for that item and I use it as a basis in setting this particular part for response validation. So once again, all you have to do is to click this one, okay? And then you have a variety of choices, okay? It depends actually on the question type, if it's paragraph, if it's check boxes, for example, and you um let's say you, you use response validation, you can you can have this kind of response validation. Say for example, select at least, okay, and then two, right? Because um let's say for example, it's a check box type of question. Uh, and they have to they have to pick two answers based on the possible answers in that particular item. So you can use response validation to make sure that they will actually pick two options among the ones that are given. So that's it for um, response validation. I hope that that was clear. You can explore it on your own because um, I don't have so much time to show you four examples for that. Okay. So let's go forward. The next thing that we're gonna talk about in terms of maximizing Google Forms is I want you to maximize the presentation setting. Okay, so what do we exactly mean when I say Maximize the presentation setting in Google Forms. And where is that exactly in Google Forms? Let's say, for example, so there we have Google Forms. And then if you go to settings, okay, if you proceed to presentation, it says that the confirmation message is your response has been recorded. What it means is that when, when someone submits this playlist part, for example, that student will see your response has been recorded as the last message. And I actually don't like that because it's like closing a lesson. It's like you met your students face to face and then you close the lesson without a really proper closure. It's like you just leave the classroom, something like that. So that's equivalent to that. So what I want to do is to make it more meaty, something that's more sensible than just your response has been recorded. So what I do, I'll show you an example. Okay, so for part two of this particular playlist that I made recently, okay, if they submit something, let's say, okay, Let's say for this particular um, playlist, let's try answering it as if we are students. Okay, let's pretend that we've done all those things, watch the video, etc. look at Mona Lisa. And then, yeah, so alternative, optional, okay, required. So we're gonna play the quizzes game. Of course, we're not gonna actually do it, but yeah, let's pretend <laughs> we've played it. Okay, so, um, and then let's submit it. Okay, so let's say we're done with the students, right? Okay, so, this is how it will look like in the student perspective. After submitting the form, let's say he has played with this game and then he has submitted the form. It says here, you have just submitted part of this playlist. Please click the link below for a discussion of the quizzes items. And then there is a link there that will lead you to the discussion, discussion of quizzes items. Okay. So let's wait for it to load. Okay. And then what it will show us is an extensive discussion of all the items that appeared in the quizzes game. So it will look something like this. Okay. So there's a discussion. It shows the quizzes items, the correct answer, as well as a discussion of the answers to those items. Okay. Um, Ms. Leia, is it possible to do that with just quizzes alone, with the um, quizzes app itself? Yes, it's actually possible, but you have to upgrade. It's actually, I think it's two US dollars a month. And because of poverty, no, I'm just kidding. Okay. Um, I actually prefer not to upgrade to that version because um, 
yes, you can put feedback in the quizzes game itself. So after they play the game, quizzes itself will give them some feedback. But I actually prefer this particular format because either way, the labor would be the same. I mean, I'm equally exhausted. I would type something, I would include images, etc. So I would rather prepare something in in uh, as a PDF file and then put it in my drive, okay, Google Drive, and then um, put the link in the form itself under the presentation part. So that's how I prefer to do it. Okay, so that's how it can look like. So I think that's really important because after doing a task, you have to make sure that the lesson is clear to them. So let's say, for example, in that case where your, your playlist part ends with the quizzes game, it's really important that you give a feedback to the students so they don't have any more questions left as um, uh, to the best extent possible. Okay, what else? Do you have some more example, Ms. Leia? Okay, let's find some more. Let's say this one. Okay, part five. It's actually the last part of the playlist. Okay, you resume collecting responses. All right, so I think it's actually, yeah, it's actually this one, part five. Okay, so let's look at this. If you look at the presentation setting, okay, it says, have you made sure that you have accomplished all the playlists, parts one to five, as listed in HyperDocs? If your answer is yes, please mark this as done in our Google Classroom, so something like that. And then thank you very much and congratulations. So they will feel a sense of accomplishment. Okay, and a really proper closure for a learning playlist because you're actually still teaching them. It's just that you're doing it asynchronously. They have to feel your presence so that they don't tell you that uh, I don't have a teacher. I'm just depending on Khan Academy, et cetera. Okay, so that's, that's how it can look like. Okay, so that's, how, that's what you can do with the presentation setting of Google Forms. Now let's look at the next one. Okay, so number three, maximize the presentation setting. So don't just uh, leave it as your response has been recorded. Okay, it's pretty dull. It's pretty, it's not so useful, right? Utilize it to its best um, possible function. Number four, provide a self-assessment and feedback form for the students to answer. What exactly is the self-assessment and feedback form for the students to answer? So I'll show you an example. And I don't want to lie about it. A self-assessment is actually a required part of the playlist, but I honestly find it useful. Although sometimes it's daunting to summary the results, to summarize the results rather, because we have to report these things as well. So um, an example would look like this. Okay, Once you view the responses, this is how it would look like. So basically the self-assessment is um, you have those learning targets, right? So this is the playlist and you have all those learning targets. So four, um, I mean three, four, okay. And then five and then six. Okay, so you have six learning targets in the whole playlist. Okay, and this one is just an exit ticket. So for really falling bodies, I have a total of six learning targets. What I will do is I will ask the students to rate themselves if, if for them it's blurry, it's clear enough, or it's crystal clear. So in the Google form itself, if you're preparing it as a question, you have the choice, multiple choice grid. And for the rows, that's where you type in all the learning targets. So this is the first learning target, second learning target, third up to the last one. So there are a total of six, right, based on this hyperdocs. Okay, so and then for the columns, blurry, okay, if it's not, uh, if blurry if it's if most of all of the of the concepts are vague and then clear enough if the student understands the lesson but with a few questions left and then of course crystal clear is pretty self-explanatory. Okay, so um, and then for the responses it will look something like this. What I appreciate about it is that um I get to figure out what particular areas they are actually weak in, right? Because when, when I meet them for synchronous sessions, especially because I'm handling an elective subject, it's once a week and I need to maximize the 30 minute period for me to clarify whatever their misconceptions are. So I, I actually use this to judge what particular aspects of the lesson must be emphasized more than the others. Example, um, 61 out of 83 respondents said uh, crystal clear for I can describe the body in a state of free fall. But as you go, as you progress towards the, lat the the remaining competencies that are actually mathematical, let's say this one, variables in sign conventions, and then this is problem solving, the rest are also problem solving. The people who are saying crystal clear are actually um, becoming less, right? So, um, and, and also you can notice that some people said blurry, five people for this one, okay, and you have a little less over there. Okay, so you can have a really quick judgment of what you should emphasize 
during synchronous session. Okay, so there are also some cases where it's pretty obvious you have to emphasize something because what would happen is that there are lots of blurry responses for a specific learning target. So that's also pretty good, right? So that is for the self-assessment of learning targets. Apart from that, for the last part of the playlist, this is actually part five, okay? So I also um, I also tell them to tell me uh, what they think about the different parts of the playlist. Is it easy, average, or difficult? This is another basis for you to tell yourself if a certain part of the playlist is well delivered or if it's not quite clear, etc. or if they think it's the hardest part. They say, if I look at this one, um, the one with the not so gorgeous result is a case three of really falling body or thrown upward, okay? So um, it has the most number of people who responded. It's difficult, right? So, and less number of people who said it's easy. So that's a good indicator that you have to emphasize case three of people in the discussion. Well, in fact, in our synchronous session, I actually discussed a sample of a case three, freely falling body. That's what I did. So that's what I can do for you. You can also ask your students to um, share what they think is the application of the concepts. And I also tell them to relate it, relate it with the Lasallian guiding principle. So they would put some drama, drama, <laughs> not necessarily drama, but they will sometimes put some sort of valuing while some people are way too technical. Okay. so. Um, and then this is a self-check. Let's say, for example, my answers in the test items are mostly correct, something like that. And then I want them to work on those items where they responded no. Okay. So, but it's just for them to um, monitor themselves. Okay. I don't um, really contact those people who said no for specific parts. Okay. So what else? Um, this is a really important part. I tell them to write something that they wish would be clarified. So overall, the, the whole part five of the playlist is actually for me to know what, what's the best thing to emphasize during the synchronous session. Okay, so let's say, for example, um, these people said none, they don't need any clarifications. Okay, um, this one is a really big problem. <laughs> okay, just kidding. Okay, and then how to cancel symbols and divisions. <laughs> okay, and then more sample problems during synchronous session so we can practice all together. That's nice, none. Common misconceptions with the negative and positive signs, right? Because the sign convention is where they also get confused, okay? So, right, someone said, it's I, Miss Leia, need to clarify the signs because it's quite confusing, okay? And then I also, I also tell them to give honest and polite feedback regarding the teacher-created videos in the playlist, okay? So, of course, they would have different feedback about that. I'm not showing you everything. If you're totally curious, you can email me. And then for number five, um, to maximize the Google Forms playlist, of course, you have to incorporate a variety of materials. In Google Forms, actually, because of its layout, because of its format, you can easily put whatever you want as um, a learning material for your students. So let's say, for example, you can put videos which can be curated, which, which means it's just listed off some references like Khan Academy. You can also create your own videos. Each of the two types has their own advantages and disadvantages, but on my part, I actually pre prefer created videos as a physics teacher because I can explain things the way I believe will be the simplest way to explain something, but not lacking details either, okay? And then you can also add PDF files. Actually, the reason why I added PDF files is because some students really told me in the feedback part of the playlist that they prefer reading. So for example, um, because some students are not fond of videos, when, when I have this video in my playlist, there's an accompanying um, PDF file, except one of, for one of the examples that I showed you, because um, I did that before the feedback uh, started pouring out. So when I read in one of the feedback that um, some students prefer reading, I started adding PDF files to accompany the video with the same um, content, for, of course. Okay. And then add puzzle tasks and gamified quizzes are also easily incorporated if you have a learning playlist, because those are just links, right? You can easily um, and then in your Google Forms for your learning playlist. Okay, so it's better that you have a wide variety because they will cater to the various learning styles of your students. And apart from that, um, it will keep things more interesting. It's not always um, just purely videos or just purely reading materials. Take into account that some of them prefer reading, some of them prefer videos, and some of them would want something different, like add puzzle tasks are actually quite good, and then gamified quizzes as well because um, they're sort of competitive. Okay, what else? Tips on creating instructional videos. Okay, the last part. 
okay, it's okay if you don't want to show your face when you make your instructional video. Because if you're not comfortable, let's say you're really camera shy, you don't like the thought of um, your students watching a video with your face in it and pausing it whenever they want, making a meme out of it or something. Okay, so if you don't want to show your face, it's fine. As long as you're comfortable. You have to be comfortable because if you're making your own instructional videos and you're uncomfortable, you're probably going to mess up in the rest of the video. Okay, and then the length of the video should be reasonable. In our EdTech training, we were taught that it should be like around six minutes or less, but it will actually depend on the difficulty of the discussion. I've gone past the six minute ideal length uh, a couple of times. And yeah, it, it's because for a reason, there are some things that you really have to explain as thoroughly as possible. And the nature of the students, your students might need a lot of um, explanations depending on their nature, but you know your students better, of course. So you have to decide on that. Do I make my videos super detailed that I explain every single step and the derivation of the equation, etc. So you have to consider those things. And then speak naturally. Um, because it will be boring if you talk like Siri or Cortana, right? They have to sound so natural. Actually, the students will like that because they don't like you to sound scripted. I mean, based on their feedback, um, they will appreciate you if you don't sound scripted. And also, they they might probably tell you that they like they like the way that you're sort of bringing back the classroom vibe, that they're feeling like they're having a personal discussion with their teacher. So don't sound like a robot. It's not going to sound good anyway. And you, you'll be uncomfortable as well. Okay, also, um, by the way, don't, don't be so conscious about bloopers. For example, if you have a really small mistake, just erase it or something and then um, get back on track quickly because um, as long as your bloopers in your video are not significantly um, blurring out the content, then I think it's really fine so that it will become natural. And if you're super OC with every single mistake, like pronunciation, etc., you wrote something wrong in Jamboard and you you don't want any erasure so you don't want to erase something you really want it to be flawless you're actually going to have a dozen of free takes okay so avoid doing that okay it's okay to make a mistake just like in normal classroom setup right you can't avoid those things okay and then your personality can be incorporated in the video okay so i've heard from someone that personality only comes into play if you're in an actual classroom setup but no okay you can be as you are when you make your videos. It can actually help the students feel at ease as they try to learn from your instructional videos. And then take the students' interest. Example, um, in my playlist number four, the sample problems in the video are actually from the Big Bang Theory, uh, Game of Thrones, um, what they call this, the Avengers and Game. Okay, so um, it's not always something like that. It's not always from shows that the students can relate to. I think that um, different teachers have their different um, levels or or nature in terms of creativity. So whatever aspect you are really good at or you can be creative at, that's how you can probably take the student's interest. Because if you force yourself into something that you are not, then it will not really come out pretty well because um, obviously you're not being yourself. Okay, so that's really hard. Okay, um, so where do we put the Google Forms? One is HyperDocs, like this one, okay. Um, and then it can also be something like this. I have some slide pakolo, like this is face, uh, like a Facebook theme. This one is YouTube, that's why, you know, trending. And then, you know, they look like thumbnails or something. Okay. And then they can also be in Google Slides. I don't want to elaborate that further. And um, because uh, it's kind of pretty obvious, you prob probably have a picture of that in your head. Okay. You can also use Google Sites. Okay. So in your Gmail account, so just go to this, this one. That's Google Sites, right? And then, um, you can make something like this. Again, this is not a tutorial, so I'm showing you the possible way that it can look like. So you can find some tutorials for um, Google Sites probably online because there's almost like a tutorial for every single thing right now because of this ODL. Okay, so if you, uh, that's how it looks like. Basically, same, essentially same content as this, but this one is in Microsoft Word. This one is in um, Google Sites. Okay, so it can look something like a website and then um, the playlist parts are there. So part one, for example, so there you have it. Learning targets, materials, practice exercise. So that's it. That's how it will look like. Same content as the one in the HyperDocs in the Google Forms. You see there's still a Google Form right there. It's just the same thing as the one earlier. Okay, and then part two, et cetera. So that, that's how it can look like. Let's say you, you feel like your students are getting bored with the HyperDocs or you yourself, you're getting bored with the HyperDocs. You might consider the kind of change or um, trip sometimes. That's okay. Okay. Uh, what else? 
Um, so once again, the challenges of synchronous, asynchronous rather sessions that we talked about is lack of, lack of guidance. But once again, um, even just a single, a simple confirmation message where you are giving instructions to your students as to what to do after doing part three of a certain playlist um, with all those instructions and telling them that you can mess, they can message you, etc., and proceed with part four, something like that. That's actually enough that uh, to tell them that you are there, you're guiding them. And also, um, let's say for example, the response validation form can also somehow make your students feel your presence and let them know you're there, you're reminding them of something they usually forget, <laughs> the, the sign conventions or whatever it is. Okay, and then immediate or adequate feedback, of course, it's all in the settings. Release, uh, you, you have to release the scores immediately after the submission. So once they submit, they uh, um, it's still fresh in their minds, whatever they are confused at, and, and they can easily locate that in the feedback form. So they can read your your um feedback, etc. Discussion of answers, and then these settings, of course. And this is how detailed it can be, although it's up to you <laughs> if you're like um patient enough <laughs> to make it even more detailed than that, or as detailed as that. And then my teachers, professor Dave, or I am paying for Khan Academy. Well, as long as you do all the efforts, as long as you try to create your own instructional videos at least once in a while, if it's really too hard for you to do it, then they won't feel being um, totally dependent on Professor Dave explains from YouTube or, or from Khan Academy. So you have to make them feel your presence, whatever way it can be, through the answer feedback, through the way you construct your, your playlist, and through the created videos that you make. So that's... Uh, those are the challenges of asynchronous sessions that we can alleviate by um, maximizing the features of Google Forms. That's the end of my presentation. Thank you so much for listening. If you don't have any more questions or concerns, you may email me at laia.lesario7 at gmail.com. Have a great time teaching your students and learning from your students.